The Atlantic forest in Brazil was once one of the biggest tropical forests in the world. It spanned an area of 1,300,000 kilometers. But today, it is just 8% of its original size. It is considered one of the most threatened ecosystems on Earth. Despite all the destruction that occurred here, the last remnants of the Atlantic forest still hold some of the greatest biodiversity on the planet. There is a high degree of endemism, that is, species that only exist here, and it is considered by experts as one of the most important areas for conserving the world's biodiversity. Located in the southeastern Brazilian state of Sao Paulo, with a length of 300 kilometers, the Serra do Mar State Park is the largest Atlantic nature reserve on the planet, and it plays a key role in the preservation of this kind of ecosystem. Because of its size, it is divided into eight regions. They are Itureru, Curucutu, Itutinga Paloes, São Sebastião, Caraguatatuba, Pisinguaba, Santa Virginia, Cunha. These steep cliffs the geological forces created 80 million years ago have helped to ensure the protection of a wide variety of ecosystems. They have preserved an important sample of the impressive historical Atlantic forest for future generations. In the park, there are still large areas of tropical forests. Coastal plains. Foggy lowlands. Marine ecosystems, such as mangroves, and almost untouched beaches. In part of the park, in the Pisinguaba region, the national park protects five beaches. Fazenda's Beach, Camburi's Brava Beach, Almada's Brava Beach and Pisinguaba Beach, which is home to the traditional Kaisara fishing community, where tourism has become an important source of income. Here, a gang of black-headed vultures have found a stingray carcass lying on a beach. These animals play a key role in the balance of this ecosystem, keeping the environment where they live clean. Disposing of everything from carcasses to bones, they are responsible for eliminating 95% of dead animals. As a result, they help prevent the spread of diseases, eliminating bacteria that could make other wild animals ill or kill them.
The park also has an abundance of springs. At the top of these mountains, in magnificent green valleys, crystalline water spurts out from the earth, transforming into creeks, streams and rivers that ensure the water supply for millions of people in southeastern Brazil. On their natural path to the sea, they sculpt the rocks, forming hundreds of waterfalls and rapids. These waters are the perfect habitat for species such as the Brazilian snake-necked turtle, an endemic species from the Atlantic forest, which can be seen in rocky streams and at the bottom of shallow, clear water ponds in mountainous areas. And Hylodes genus toads that only live in the Atlantic forest. They are popularly called torrent frogs and 25 different species have been discovered so far. They are always found on wet rocks, camouflaged against them to protect themselves from predators. Because the running water around them is very loud, the males produce a shrill call that can be heard over the surrounding noise. And they also exhibit visual signs by raising, and waving one leg. The calls and visual signs are the Hylodes species' main ways of communication, and the males use them to defend their territory from intruders and attract females. But they are not the only singers around here. Each species has a unique call, which is used to attract females during mating season. These calls are a way for males and females to identify others from the same species to avoid hybridization between different species. Some species, such as the smith frog, have interesting reproductive rituals. In the summer, the males build nests shaped like pots on the edge of ponds and dams and guard them bravely from other males. From these nests, the male starts to croak, attracting females of the same species. One female becomes interested by the croaking and moves closer to one of the males, which then climbs on the female's back and embraces it. Through this nuptial embrace, known as an amplexus embrace, the male fertilizes the female, which then spawns into the nest. The tadpoles mature in the nest, and when the rains flood the nest, the tadpoles move into the larger body of water where they complete their development. Other species, such as this tree frog, use bromeliad plants to reproduce. The biologist Leo Malagoli studies these frogs. He has discovered that this species deposits its eggs on the inside of bromeliads, on the edge of streams. And when there is higher rainfall, they flood and the tadpoles are lifted into the streams where they then develop into frogs. The Atlantic forest is home to over 400 species of amphibians 
and most of them are endemic. This significant number is thanks to the rainforest, as the animals depend on its humidity and to the mountainous terrain which in the past acted as a natural barrier, isolating specific amphibian populations, helping the emergence of families, genera and species that only exist here. There are approximately 200 species in the Ceridumar Park, one of the largest amounts of different species in one area in the world, and almost half of the total of the biome. This number continues to grow every year as new species are discovered. It was here in 2014 that the biologist Thais Condes discovered two new toad species of the genus Brachycephalus. They are exclusive to the Atlantic forest and popularly known as saddleback toads. Turning over the moist leaves on the forest floor, she shows us one of her discoveries, the Brachycephalus crispus. So far, its only known habitat is a mountain in the Cunha region of the park. The park's hilly landscape and low-lying forests create great differences in altitude, which contribute to the variety of different Brachycephalus toads. They are extremely sensitive, feeling slight temperature differences between mountains and valleys, and they are not very mobile, so they cannot move from one mountain to another. Therefore, the toad populations have slowly developed into a different species on each mountain. 28 genus species are known so far, and most of them have only been discovered by scientists in the last few years, as research in the higher areas of the Atlantic forest has increased. This is another Brachycephalus toad, discovered in 2009. Just like most of these toads, it moves slowly through the damp forest leaves. Its yellow or orange colors are associated with the presence of chemical compounds, similar to tetrodotoxin, the same toxin in pufferfish. No studies have yet been conducted to find out which of the brachycephalus toads have these toxins or its function in these animals. These mini toads are among the smallest land vertebrae. Their size in adulthood does not usually exceed two centimeters in length. They have a number of features associated with the evolutionary miniaturization process, such as the hyperossification of skeletal elements and the complete loss or reduction of digits and phalanges. Here, on top of a five cent coin, we can see their size more clearly. The males, which are smaller than the females, use calls to attract partners and also much more aggressive noises to defend their territory from other males. And when two male frogs meet, one simply raises its arm and opens its mouth to show the other that the territory is already occupied. Down on the forest floor, this tiny toad is having some difficulties. Something seems to be bothering it. A fly is tirelessly chasing it around the forest floor. And here we can observe for the first time 
some rare behavior. The fly is using the toad as a host for its larvae. Here we can see the fly depositing two larvae onto the toad, which is fighting, trying to get rid of the unwanted guests. By zooming in and watching in slow motion, we can see the two larvae being deposited more clearly. The toad managed to get rid of one of them, but the other larva would probably manage to survive, causing the toad a lot of discomfort until it develops into a fly. The larvae are deposited in the amphibian's soft tissues, and as they grow, they consume its flesh. Amphibians face many other dangers around here. They are on the menu for a wide variety of snakes. For example, this Jararakusu lurking on the forest ground. Or this Jararaka coiled around the branches, warming its body in the early morning sun. Within the whole of the Atlantic forest, there are approximately 1,020 bird species, 188 of which are endemic. The park still protects around 500 rare and endemic species, such as the brave black-cheeked gnat eater. the lush Brazilian tanager, the little pin-tailed mannequin, and the endangered bare-throated bellbird which has one of the most powerful voices on the planet. Its singing could even damage your ears if you get too close. These forests still hide many secrets. On the banks of the streams, shaded by the dense forest, lives a rare endangered bird. The Atlantic Royal Flycatcher, which has rarely been filmed. It is endemic to the Atlantic Forest and inhabits a small area that extends from the state of Santa Catarina to the state of Espirito Santo. This bird is very sensitive to environmental deterioration and needs undisturbed surroundings to survive. It inhabits the outer parts of the forest and is a patient predator. It stays poised on small branches for long periods looking for prey. Its pincer-shaped flat beak catches flying insects such as butterflies and dragonflies and dangerous insects with poisonous stingers like bumblebees and wasps. After capturing their prey in the air, they return to their perch and bang it against the branch to get rid of dangerous stingers or large wings. One of its most striking features is its multicolored crest that it opens when it feels threatened. It is a spectacle that lasts only a split second 
but its beauty is still enchanting. Insects are on the menu for several other species around here as well. Like the Siracura trogon, a medium-sized bird with rich and colorful plumage in a wide variety of color combinations. They spend much of their day still watching the forest, feeding on caterpillars, grasshoppers, spiders, and small insects. Its melancholic call sounds like a single repeated note, and it uses it to mark its territory and attract females. and the bakurao, a night bird which catches insects with the help of its large eyes. Woodpeckers also eat insects, but they catch them using a different technique. Woodpeckers of all shapes and sizes can be found in the park. Like the little white barred piculae, The colourful yellow-fronted woodpecker. And the great blonde-crested woodpecker. They use their strong beaks to look for insects and lava in trees. The birds that best show the true liveliness of the forest are the tanagers. These small and agile birds are a real explosion of colour. At altitudes of 900 metres, we can find the beautiful brassy-breasted tanager, which are only found in the Atlantic forest. And in lower areas near the ocean lives the green-headed tanager. And the red-necked tanager. These two species are usually seen together, scouring the edges of the forest in flocks, searching for fruit and other delicacies. Like this plant stalk, known as spiked spiral flag ginger.
This bird is the shiny cowbird, and although it is not quite as beautiful as the tanager, it does have an interesting history. Unlike other birds, they do not make their own nests to lay their eggs. Instead, they lay them in other birds' nests, so that when they hatch, the other birds will raise them and feed them as if they were their own babies. Because of this mischievous behaviour, their Portuguese name, Chopin, has become a synonym for profiteer in Brazil, even appearing in the dictionary. The biggest victims of this trick are the rufous-collared sparrows. When the hatchlings are ready to leave the nest, they are already much bigger than the parents, as we can see here. The rufous-collared sparrow mother desperately searches for food, trying to satisfy the large babies who continuously chirp for more food. Luckily for the mother, shiny cowbirds begin to look for their own food when they are just 15 days old. Birds have an important relationship with the forest. They play a key role in the food chain as predators and as prey. The infinite number of species in the park keeps the forest healthy and they all actively participate in the food chain, eating the fruit and grains, helping to scatter the plant seeds and maintaining the forest's diversity. These are the Dusaras palm trees, and they are fundamental to the life of the forest. Unfortunately, they're a very popular local delicacy and are used to make canned palm hearts and have now become endangered. The production of canned palm hearts involves cutting the whole tree down, which means they die and cannot grow again. From September to January, these trees are filled with fruit and are the major source of food for many species. Like the red-breasted toucan. They enjoy the Dusaris fruit and they also feed on arthropods and small vertebrates, often plundering the nests of other birds. 
These birds are excellent at scattering the palm tree seeds. When the seeds are too big to digest, they regurgitate them after a little while and are usually by then in a different part of the forest. When the seeds are small, they make their way through the digestive system before being defecated. These beautiful birds are still very common in the park and are not endangered. Unlike the black-fronted piping guan, which has disappeared from wide areas of the Atlantic forest and is now at risk of extinction. They depend on virgin forests almost completely undisturbed by humans to survive, and live high up in the forests, in places where the Jukara palm tree is abundant. As we can see here, they usually stay perched in these branches for hours feeding. They are big birds that can weigh up to 1.4 kilograms. It is a threatened species, not only because its habitat is being destroyed, but it is a very docile bird and is still hunted in Brazil. Its population has been drastically reduced, disappearing from most places where it used to be common and abundant. Unless something is done, it could become extinct in just a few years. And like the red-breasted toucan, they have a very important role in the dispersal of the Jusaras palm tree seed by regurgitating and defecating the seeds around the forest, as you can see here. The maroon-bellied parakeet also enjoys the fruit from the Jusara palm tree. Here, a flock is having a real feast on the fruit. Just like the plain parakeets, they eat fruit from the forest as their main dish. And this parakeet is enjoying a good meal from a guava tree. Some others are feasting on the palm tree, too busy to notice that some seeds are falling down. The channel-billed toucan also feeds on fruit, but they have a much more varied menu. They are predators and hunt other species of birds, like plain parakeets. They live in groups and prefer to be up high in the treetops, sharing the space with other forest species, like the brown howler, which lives in groups of families of 2 to 12. They move slowly through the treetops, spending much of their day resting, taking part in social activities. Like we can see here, a teenager is grooming an elder. They feed in the morning and in the late afternoon.
and their diet consists mainly of leaves. They use their tails as a fifth limb, leaving their hands free to feed themselves. Other primates live here too, like these white tufted ear marmosets. Despite their endearing appearance, they are an invasive species which originate from other regions of Brazil. They used to be common animals to have as pets, and when they were released into the wild by their previous owners, they adapted very well and have spread over wide regions of southern and southeastern Brazil. However, a species of marmoset already exists in the area, the buffy tufted ear marmoset. An endemic species from the region that was already at risk of extinction due to the destruction of its habitat. The two species have few genetic differences and they have begun to form groups together with mixed offspring, threatening the species that was already at risk of disappearing even more. This native marmoset is the leader of a group of invader marmosets. While the group is feeding, it keeps an eye out for predators. It warns the others with these high-pitched sounds when it sees danger. Unfortunately, this species could disappear from the Atlantic forest, at least in its current form. The Atlantic forest has more plant diversity than some continents like Europe and North America. It is estimated that approximately 97% of the Atlantic forest flora produces flowers adapted to pollination by animals and only 3% are pollinated by the wind. In temperate forests, for example, the wind has a more important role in the dispersion of plant seeds. One of the theories for the high dependence on animal pollination is the low air movement within tropical forests and the huge diversity of trees and other forms of life. This often means that there are low concentrations and large distances between individuals of the same species. So direct dispersion of pollen is more effective and this can only be done efficiently by animals. The variety of colors and shapes of plants in the forest is immense, and they fight for attention of insects, bats, and a very special group of birds, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are only found in the Americas, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, and so far, 322 species are known. 
The greatest biodiversity of species occurs in tropical regions in Brazil and Ecuador. And the park is home to about 20 species. Weighing between just two and six grams, hummingbirds are the smallest birds on the planet. They have an underdeveloped sense of smell, but extremely sharp vision. They are especially attracted to tubular, red, orange and odorless flowers that open during the day and which are ideal for their long, thin beaks. Carlos Cohino is a biologist that conducts studies about the plant pollination in the park. Well, here we have this little flower from Pico do Corcovado. It is from the Cifacanthalus species, and it's a small plant with characteristics that are common in a plant that is pollinated by hummingbirds. So as you can see here, it is almost completely red. With just a little bit of yellow detail, and it is tube-shaped, the tube is more or less the size of a hummingbird's beak, the kind of hummingbird that we have here. And here in the Atlantic forest, in general, we have a lot of species, the same features, and the hummingbirds are vital to their pollination and reproduction. There are at least 60 species that we already know of, that we have been studying, that have the same features and are also pollinated by the hummingbirds. In exchange for this pollination service, hummingbirds carry the pollen from one plant to another, guaranteeing that the flowers are pollinated and will produce fruits and seeds. As payment for doing this, they receive the nectar produced by the plants. The nectar is made inside the flower. In the case of this flower, the nectar gathers in the bottom of this tube here. The hummingbird's skeleton and muscular build are adapted to allow them to fly very quickly and agilely. They are the only birds capable of flying backwards and hovering in the air. The speed that they bat their wings is very fast, and the smaller species, like the little festive coquette, can flap their wings at up to 70 to 80 times per second. All this frantic flapping requires a good energy supply, and so they consume a lot of nectar. This tree with chandelier-shaped flowers is called a coral tree. It is one of the most beautiful trees in the Atlantic forest and loses its leaves completely during the flowering season. Its flowers are very tasty and attract several animals which enjoy their nectar, like the blue dacnus and the banana quid 
which are very common around here and really like to indulge on nectar, fruits and little arthropods. With their curved and sharp pointed beaks, they can perforate the base of the coral tree's flowers and reach its sweet nectar. This little female hummingbird, called a violet-capped wood nymph, has turned this tree into its feeding territory. It takes advantage of the holes left from the banana quid to reach the reserves of flower nectar, as we can see it doing here. Just like most of the species around here, it is very territorial and staunchly defends its feeding territory. When they have established their territory, Hummingbirds carry pollen between flowers of the same plant or other plants nearby, which results in a smaller number of plants being pollinated. They usually stay perched on branches observing the environment around them, looking for intruders. When they pinpoint a likely opponent, they try to intimidate it by bristling their feathers, putting on a beautiful performance. This sombre hummingbird looks like it has identified an intruder. And this Brazilian ruby hummingbird shows its beautiful plumage to intimidate its opponent. The swallow-tailed hummingbird is extremely aggressive and one of the most common species in the park. But on this occasion, it seems like another hummingbird from the same species has stolen its precious perch. This little one is called a festive coquette and besides being one of the smallest hummingbirds in the park, it is very agile and doesn't back down from a fight. Carefully watching its surroundings, it bristles its feathers, trying to look bigger and frighten its opponent. When the performance fails, it starts an air attack to try and kick the intruders out. The saw-billed hermit is different from most other hummingbirds. It is not territorial. It passes through many feeding routes and is able to visit more than 200 flowers per day. It prefers the bromeliads flowers and is one of its main pollinators. And this one has some babies.
These two are in the final phase of their development and the nest looks cramped. One takes advantage of the lack of space to train its wings that it will need to use soon. Their mother is nearby. When the mother returns to the nest, the babies become excited, hungry for food, and one by one they are fed with the precious nectar. The park still has some surprises. In the Kurakutu area, which is partly located inside the city of Sao Paulo, there is a unique plant almost unknown just a few kilometers away from one of the biggest cities in the world. The Campus Nublados are a wide expanse of foggy lowlands located in the Saro do Mar Park. They once covered a large part of the area where Sao Paulo is now located. In the past, it was known as Sao Paulo dos Campos de Piritaninga. Despite its unfertile soil, these fields are almost always covered by a humid fog that comes from the sea, creating rich biodiversity. There are orchids, trees that are unable to grow properly and look like natural bonsai because of the lack of nutrients in the soil. And carnivorous plants, such as the Drosaris, that like this kind of environment and multiply in the humidity and the acidic and fertile soils. Its tentacle-shaped leaves are covered by glandular trichomes that secrete a slimy substance that attract little insects which they eat. Insects become stuck in the sticky traps where they die and are slowly digested. The nutrients of their bodies are absorbed into the leaves' surface. This fly is trying to fight as much as it can to escape from the plant's sticky tentacles. But the more it moves, the more trapped it gets. The pinus is an invader plant that is very well adapted to the weather in this region and today it has become a great threat to the Campos Nublados.
Its spine spread on the wind, and if nothing is done, the landscape could be forever changed in just a few years. The forest has significantly reduced in size, and we have a duty to preserve the real treasure that is the Atlantic forest. Yeah.